Welcome to Rick's Corner, brought to you by Old School Labs, the brand I trust and the only one I put my name to. Use my code, Drayson12, on the link below. Rick's Corner, the man, the myth, the legend, now on with the show. Welcome to Rick Drayson Live. Uh, this show is about many different things. I go from bodybuilding to fitness to nutrition to athletics to acting to maybe a little sex to relationships to almost everything that encompasses your life. I'd like to welcome my guest, Gary Cole. He's known for his work in Midnight Collar, Pineapple Express, Office Space, Talladega Nights, Tammy, and Veep, among many, many other shows. And it's a pleasure to have him here today. Thank you, Gary, for hey, being Rick. here. How you doing? Or should I say Gary Coleman? Well, you know, when I first got to uh, Los Angeles, uh, there seemed to be uh, some kind of uh, trouble remembering my name. And every casting door that opened, the first words out of the casting director's mouth was, and may I now introduce Gary Coleman. I mean <laughs> Gary Cole, so, but it, it was at least an icebreaker. So. Yeah, this yeah. gone quite a bit. Uh, it, did, it lasted a while. Gary Coleman at the time, I got to town like in like mid 80s and he was yeah. huge, you know, different strokes. No, of course, yeah, yeah. So. he wasn't huge, but he was huge. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't huge, he, but his he, body of work was. He was a huge yeah. short man. Um, <laughs> I just want to go back a little bit when you were younger, uh, before you got into the uh, theater or movies or acting and that kind of stuff, what did you do? I was like, um, you know, I was, a, I was kind of a wannabe jock. I, I grew up playing Little League Baseball. Yeah. And when I got to high school, I played, uh, I played football and basketball. Uh, and long about uh, second year of high school, it, it became clear that uh, that probably wasn't going to lead to anything necessarily, yeah. uh, uh, even though I enjoyed it. But that's when I that's when I got involved in uh, in acting um, in high school. Was that with theater? Is that what you right? Were, yeah. yeah, started doing plays in in high school. Right. Do you think plays were very important to your career? Sure, because I stayed in the theater through college, uh, and then I lived outside of Chicago. Uh, and went to Chicago and did theater, you know, for about five or six straight years before I came to uh, right. Los Angeles. Does theater pay? Well, that's relative when you're, you know, when you're 21 and, uh, yeah. you know, you want to pay some rent. Yeah, you can survive depending on what you want to survive in. Uh, but uh, compared to the, you know, the uh, television and, and, and movie world, no, there, there is no comparison. No, I know that. But I have a reason for asking that because in, in L.A., for example, so many people want to be actors and actresses. In every restaurant you go to, they're an actor or they're a waiter. Right. You have to survive. And it's the same thing in the music business. People try to make it and they, they have other jobs. And it's the same thing in the wrestling business. I, I know a lot of guys who want to be WWE champions. And they got to really what we call stink out the territories and get to be seen and get to be known. But you have to eat, so you have to have a regular job. And to some people, having a regular job means that they're not successful, that they'll never reach success because they work at Denny's. But you got to survive. Right. You just have to. Right. So, I mean, that's a tricky thing to, to negotiate. I, I think, uh, and it, it also, it's important where you are, too. In Chicago, yeah. at the time, when I was kind of breaking into business, early 80s, um, you know, compared to both coasts, Chicago is a fairly manageable place financially for mm -hmm. a, a young artist up mm -hmm. and coming to, still? to survive. Well, it probably compa still compared to uh, either Los Angeles or New York, sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, you know, everything's more expensive now. But it was just a, it was a, it was a good environment to start in um, because there was less pressure in a lot of areas, one of them being financial. And then um, usually what happened in Chicago was by the time somebody got to be 30 years old, they either migrated here or New York or they stayed because there, you know, there, there is a way to make a living in Chicago. Um, 
uh, with the theater and commercials and whatever right. movie rolls through town. But it's right. just a you know just personal choice. What helped you uh, coming here? What helped you get a start in the business? What was it that did it? Well, I was lucky in the fact that I, I came here with a job. I was still in Chicago, mm -hmm. and there in, in 1984, there was a, a, a book out. It had probably come out in 1982 called Fatal Vision, which was about uh, this Green Beret doctor who was convicted of killing his family. NBC at the time was doing a miniseries of it. They had not cast the lead, and it was one of those... The casting director knew somebody who was in NBC production, made a phone call. Nobody had, had taken this role for a long time. They were ready to shoot, and it was just one of those things. I got lucky, got the role, and that's how I kind of arrived here in Los Angeles. That's a good way of, yeah. of getting it. What did you do prior to that as far as television? Is, is that before Midnight Caller? It was. I had only done uh, one. I did a small role in another television movie, which was shot in the region of Chicago. It, it, it actually was shot near uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, but they mm -hmm. cast out of Chicago. And that's the only other camera work I had done before before this miniseries. And then I did, before Midnight Caller, I probably did maybe another two or three you know, television movies. Midnight Caller was a good show. Yeah, yeah. How long did that go? We had, um, we did three seasons, but the first season was shortened because that was, in 1988, there was one of many. Uh, there was a writer strike, right. and so the season well. got off to a, uh, a late start. So we only did 16 shows the first season. And then from that, you already had an agent, or you got an agent in LA? I had an agent uh, from Chicago when I landed the Fatal Vision job, and in the in the in the year after that, I I transitioned to um, I believe it was William Morris. Mm -hmm. I've hit them all by now. I've, I've, oh, I, I know. I've burned goes. all the bridges. Yeah, there. I I don't, I don't know. There's no place left to go. So hopefully, I'll stay with the agent I have now. Okay, I have a question about that too because having agents, and I've had several for what I've done, and I've done commercials, and I've done film, and the wrestling really opened the door for me because I was on TV twice a week, and people saw it here and Hollywood. Right. Oh, let's get Rick for the role of such and such. Right. And back then, it was usually a role because I was big, and they wanted that type of character. Now that I'm a handsome guy, I just want to do the uh, romantic leads. Of, of course, course, right? But, but having an agent, you know, there's good and bad, and this is how it works. And big isn't always good, am I right? Right. Actually, the first agency I landed in at the time in the mid-'80s was CAA, which was probably considered them. the, not only the largest, but the premier agency. Mm -hmm. And I went no place because I was, you know, I had just, I was an entry-level employee, you were basically. in the files. And I just, right, and I just, like, you know, kind of dropped through the crack. I was also not very savvy about anything, right. let, let alone this business. Yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, that was probably not a good fit for me to begin with. It just popped up, so I, you know, I, I went It happens for it. like that. Did you do commercials, too? I only did, I did one commercial uh, early in my career in Chicago for some car company. I don't remember. What, no, an insurance company. I don't remember which. Some small company in Indiana. Yeah. And, uh, and that was it early in my career. But yeah. back, back then, it was that you're not supposed to cross the line from film to commercial. Remember those days? Right. Or, or film to movies. Or exactly. film to television. Or television, for yeah. sure. And now it's changed. Now, now entirely. there's no rules at all. No it, rules it, at all. There's absolutely no rules. Did you, um, you worked very much as a serious actor doing serious roles. Yes. But then you got a little bit into comedy, and then you went to comedy. Right. Which do you prefer? Um... I don't know that I prefer one over the other, and I, I don't even know that I, because I don't, I've, I've never thought that you, you actually go about it differently. I think that you, it's, it's really the material and the audience's perception that is different. Mm -hmm. My job is basically the same, you know, uh, it's to, you know, bring the best choices I can to the character uh, and, and kind of, you know, realize what my part of this whole story is with all these other you know elements to it but isn't it, with the comedy wouldn't it be the timing or is that just the well one thing about comedy is that the, I, I guess you can say this about comedy why one, one reason it's 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 said to be more difficult is the fact that it's it's much more easily uh observed if it fails you know, <laughs> yeah. comedy, if something isn't sort of funny, it either is or it isn't. Right. You, know, you can watch a drama and go, I wonder if this is good. Do you think this is good? I don't know. Is this good? If it's not funny, it's just kind of deadly. Yeah. It's very obvious that it's not funny. Yeah. So and, that, and, that's, what, that's where the difficult And part. when you're playing to a camera, you don't know. No. 
there's no response. No, it's tough to feel. It's really just a, it's an instinct and it is. You can feel, and by the same token, go the other way. It can feel terrific. And then somehow when it gets on the screen and maybe it's the editor's fault, maybe it's your fault, and then it just lays dead and you, you never know. Okay, so you did the movie Tammy. Right. Which was a comedy. Right. But you played your role a little bit more serious, but it still came off funny. Yeah, I mean, he was, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, it, it's really about what a character wants. And that character basically wanted one thing. Exactly. <laughs> well, he got, he wanted two things. One, yeah. he was already taken care of. He was drunk. Yeah. That, that he wanted that, and he was able to attain that. And yeah. the next thing he wanted was Susan Sarandon. In the backseat of a car. Right. And so <laughs> he worked on that as, as hard as he could. And then he basically uh, found, he, he wound up with that, too. That was great. Yeah. Um, during your career in acting, um, everybody progresses and gets better and better and better. How did you first put yourself in a role and, and get the feeling of what you were supposed to do? I mean, you know, you go on auditions and they give you lines to read and then you read them. They say, no, read it this way, no, read it that way. But you, I always found that I just read whoever I was. And I had one cast director tell me one time, scream the line out. I said, it doesn't make sense for me to scream. I'm a big, imposing guy. If I'm more subtle about my feelings, it'll come across even better. Right. Right? Right. She argued with me. Finally, I just walked out. I said, no, I'm not going to scream. Yeah. I mean, nobody's, you know, nobody's yeah. got every answer. I, the only thing I can, you know, there's, never, there's no handbook, really, other than the only thing I figured out that started to work for me in auditions was that whatever I do, whether it's, whether they like it or not, it, it has to be, specific and it has to be I have to make choices about it mm -hmm. I always say I'd rather see a performance that makes me angry where to the point where I go what is he doing what kind of, that is so yeah. offensive yeah. Yeah. as opposed to a, a, a performance that's boring or vanilla going I don't know what I don't know what they're doing they're, they're yeah. just there occupying space yeah you know? I'm just talking. Um, so it's making definite choices and even if you come up short You've you've you know you've done what you've wanted to do. Exactly. Whether somebody responds to it, you know you, that's out of your hand. Do you still have to audition? Uh, it depends on what it is. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'm 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 fortunate that it's it is just, you know, it is a phone call. But that's not all the time. Like for, for Veep, for example, was a, right. was an audition. Um, but the good news about Veep was that when you have an audition and you have great material to audition with, mm -hmm. obviously you're, you know, you're, you're going to be better. It was very specific. It was really, you know, really well written so that you're not working so hard to invent something that mm -hmm. works. You know, it just kind of took care of itself. You've you know? played the president, you've played a vice president. You've played those roles, which is pretty cool. And um, in Veep, you were talking about how a lot of it is improv. Right. Uh, explain to them how that works because normally you go on a show, you get a script, here's your dialogue, and this is what you do. Right. And I'll, I've, I've always felt, and you may be the same way, if the dialogue isn't written properly and I can't read it, it doesn't come out right. If I could just say it this way, then that way, it might sound right. better. Right. Well, most shows that I came from, my background was in, was that when I started, was, was television drama, either television movies or television. Right. Uh, series, uh, drama series, and the the writing and 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 performing it was fairly rigid in terms of you're staying with the script. The word, you know, the writer was God, and you you know you went with the words that were on the page. Uh, that's changed a lot of places over the years, but in Veep, um, improv is used to a great deal. Not so much while we're shooting, but in rehearsal to generate material for later. They let you just go with it. Yeah, at, they, we will. The, the process is: we'll get a draft from the writers. Right. We will sit around a table. We will read that draft. Then we will take that script and we will <laughs> throw it on, in a, into a pile in the corner. Right. And everybody gets up and starts to do the scenes that were written, but without that dialogue, just oh, the wow. situation, yeah. and and just kind of free form it. And then all the writers are observing that, and they will take that, use some of it, throw some of it away. Um, and then add to it, and then we'll get another script, do the same thing, read it around the table, and then the same thing will take place again. So I was, uh, they're taking notes on what's going yeah. on, at least recording or something. Right. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, but what it does cause is a, 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 a tone that is spontaneous. And even while we're shooting, they're pretty lax about, you know, lines of dialogue that are on the page. As right. long as, as long as what, uh, needs to be achieved and the scene is achieved, not so worried so much about what the specific dialogue is. Yeah, because you said something earlier, and it was true years ago, you did not mess with the writer's work. No. 
You change one word, they came right out. But that's still true in a lot of places. Is so, it? You know, the writer is, you know, I yeah. mean, that, these are my words, that's yeah. how you're saying them, and if you don't like it, take a walk. Yeah. And now you worked on Entourage? I did. Yeah. How, how long were you on that? I did uh, Entourage, I did, I forget what season I came in, but I did three episodes of, I think it was season f four or five. And then the following uh, season, I did, I think it was uh, eight of the 10 episodes. Very popular show. Yeah, yeah, o I love doing that show. Office Space? Yeah, Office Space was, uh, was Mike Judge. Big hit. Um, yeah, and, and actually not a hit immediately. It kind, of, uh, it, it kind of sneaked up on everybody. It was, um, um, you know, a modest, budget yeah. so it, it didn't really I, I, you couldn't really call it a failure because it didn't really cost anything to make no, but the content was good yeah no mike judge is a is you know he, he's just a you know he's just a comedy icon and, and he he really tapped into some a culture that a lot of people identified of course yeah. out of all the things and this is going to be a tough question because i think people ask me things like this uh, I always say, well, who's your favorite guy you wrestled with? I don't know. They were all pretty good. But what, what were your favorite shows and, and actors that you worked with that really stick out in your head that really enjoyed more than anything? I, well, I, Office Space was one of them. I really enjoyed, uh, I, I think Mike's talent is great. And it was, you know, that was a real honor to do that. Right. I also enjoyed um, and was a huge fan before I even got there of Will Ferrell. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when I did uh, yeah, Talladega Nights. Right. And also met Adam McKay, who yeah. was his writing partner and director, who right. also did Anchorman and Step Brother. Oh, whatever. you had a good time on that. Yeah, I mean that was that was and that character too. That was a uh, that was just a great deal of fun. So without naming names, because we don't want to offend anybody, was there ever a situation that you worked that you just said, "I just want to get this over with and never see it again"? <laughs> <laughs> there was recently. Uh, an experience I had, and and believe me, there's a lot of there's a lot of low budget movies. Yes, but there, everything's but the, low budget. But that nice. spectrum is like, I mean, there's there's low budget, and then there's like, you know, no, and then there's no budget. Right. Then there's <laughs> dust. <laughs> but I wound up in a movie. Actually, the material was actually pretty good, and that's why I decided to do it. Uh, you know, script with good writer, uh, very kind of moving and and kind of heartfelt script. But he was a first time director. But what I didn't know was that most of the people that he hired for his crew were also had no experience doing movies. First time. And so we spent, you know, we wound up doing, you know, spending five, six hours doing things that should take 20 minutes. And that, that, yeah. was, that was tough to do. It's like, let's get Jack out of the house. Hold the camera. <laughs> yeah, it was just, I mean, the first day, I think, for some, it, literally somebody forgot to turn the camera on or so, something like that. I mean, yeah. it was just, it was ridiculous. Oh, my God. All right. Now, I want to talk about something else because... Uh, I come from nutrition, I come from fitness and bodybuilding, and it's a huge part of my life. And I know that athletics was a huge part of your life as well. And you're in the gym every day yeah. with your headset on and you're like into it. How many days a week do you work out? I, now I go pretty much every day. What I, my pattern used to be that I would, I would go to the gym and then I would run, but I would run outside. I you ran in the park, out, right? Yeah, yeah, run out streets or wherever. And so I would alternate. And we talked about this earlier. I started to develop some kind of back issue yeah. uh, so that when I ran, I, it would stiffen up or I would just feel out mm -hmm. of sorts. I would mm -hmm. visit a chiropractor every, seemingly every seven weeks for a period of time. Sure. Uh, and so I kind of, I did an experiment and started to run on the, is that called the elliptical? Is that what it's called? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's good. That's what I run on in the gym. And since I've done that, that has virtually stopped any back issue i had basically was evaporated so. well there has no impact on there right so it's, it's moving but you're not really pounding right. the heels, no, pounding the heels. Yeah. so that so now i'm in there I, you know it's it's every day in there well yeah. you're in really good shape right. i saw some abs speaking out one day too <laughs> so, and they, i work on it that's the that's i'm, I'm told to just if you're going to do anything as we progress into our yeah Look later at, years look at Gary's six pack yeah <laughs> keep focusing on that you know all how's, you gotta do is take a trip to target and walk around and go yeah i'm gonna do these oh my god i know how's your diet as far as nutrition do you follow anything yeah uh, i wish it was better i just i i still eat like a teenager sometimes well you are a teenager well yeah but i, I mean i i try to be good and i i sometimes am you know mm -hmm. i eat you know decent food and and but i eat a lot of crap you, you eat know? anything you want uh I guess pretty much, but I don't avoid, I don't have a real big sweet tooth, that, that's good. I don't like, you know, I, I kind of, anytime, 
real intense sugar things come up, I, I do have a red flag. I didn't I, used to, but I, I know that. somebody sitting right over there that likes ice cream every night, and she's and she says it's not going to hurt you because it melts. <laughs> <laughs> it's as if it wasn't there. Yeah, it's like it's gone. There's no there's, right, right, right. there's no evidence at all. You know what? I like that. I like that theory. I'm going to try that out. But uh, you stay slim. Yeah, no, I've been able to, you know, I've, I've been able to burn it off, and, and um, you know, I, I think I'm conscious of it, but I do, you know, I, I do eat, I mean, I eat a lot of bread, you know, which I would, maybe shouldn't do, but, you know. I, I love just, bread. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 like I take that over anything sweet any day of the week. Right, right. I just bread like and butter. Yeah. Um, how many times a day do you eat? Uh, I probably do, I would say it's two meals. That's it? Yeah. Nothing in between? Well, there probably is, but I don't, I don't have like, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have three, you know, squares. No, I would, I'd say two and change, I'd call it. Okay, the only reason I ask that is because I was raised in the bodybuilding field is to have five meals a day. Wow. It's the high protein, low carb thing where you eat every two and a half hours. Protein builds muscle, burns body fat, and keeps you harder and, and leaner at the same time. And is there, a, is there a time cutoff for carbs? Is there supposedly that? No carbs after so-and-so? Say, say after seven at night. Cut it out. I don't think I believe that because no? your body's a 24-hour clock, right? And your body doesn't know what time it is, and you can still burn as you're sleeping, especially if your dreams are like mine, because they're crazy. <laughs> I'm <laughs> going to go with that, so then I can eat carbs. So, after so my last meal is at 11 o'clock at night is protein with a little bit of fiber. I got to have something. All right. So I, I just think I, I just have that, that mentality of the way I was training for years, just to be bigger for wrestling and bodybuilding, and, and now I want to be leaner as I get older. I want to stay trim. I think it's healthier. Yeah. Um, we're going to close, but I want to ask you a question. What would your advice be to anybody who wants to get into acting today or, or do sitcoms or that type of thing? Because it's a long, hard road, like anything. I guess it's, it's that, um, you know, it, it, the thing that I think sustained me and I think will sustain somebody is if they, if they are really certain that that is the road they want to take, if they have a real need to perform, all of the other stuff, I think, will, will work itself out, you know. But I think there has to be a, you know, and fanaticism is a, is a negative word, I guess, but some kind of real, you know, just kind of blinders on path to it. Um, somebody put it once, and I think Brian Cranston said, and I, I, I heard that, and it made a lot of sense to me. He goes, when I went into this, when I chose to do this, I didn't have plan B. You know, I didn't right. say I'm going to do this, and if this doesn't work out, I'll do this. Right. There was no this over here. I it was just, it, yeah. I'm doing this, I'm in, I'm in for the duration. I mean, you know, that, obviously that can change, but right. that's, that's, I think, the most important thing. And all the other stuff is, is just, you know, stuff along the road. Just to take an extra minute here, I know what you're saying. However, I, I train people for wrestling for WWE, and I have kids who come to me. They're 5'8", 120 pounds, 14 years old. I want to be a superstar. That's what I want to be. Good to have the goal. But I tell them to have plan B because that's a very limited market. It's a very powerful injury market that you're going to get hurt. And you've got to be big to be able to take it. And if you don't make it, and a lot of guys go to 30, 35, and they get burnt out and hurt, they got to go to plan right. B. Right. No, I agree with that. What I, and, and I think that what, what is, what's, what's important is, because sometimes they get the feeling, especially talking to kids, I, I did this in a Q&A with kids, is that they're, they're looking at a result. Right. That I'm going, if I do this, I'm going to get A, B, and C reward. Or right. I'm going, people are going to think of me this way, or I will, I will, you know, I'll be on the cover of this. Or, yeah, exactly. If that's the goal, that's dangerous. It is dangerous. If it's, if it's the fulfillment of doing the work itself, right. if that's the goal, then that's a safer foundation. That's me. very well put. Yeah. If people want to find you on the Internet, where can we find you? You have a website? I, you know what? I have a website, but I don't run it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the website? I'm, I think it's the Gary Cole Archives. You just Google that, and I think. What is archives? Gary Cole Archives. Gary Cole Archives. Yeah. You have a Twitter. You have any of those? No, things? I'm just. I'm a. I'm a. And, I, and you could literally even, a technological dinosaur. You could even read the link I sent you on your iPad. No, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you for being here, Gary. You bet. It's been a real Thanks pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time for me to be able to talk about this kind of stuff. I know the viewers love it, and you guys have just seen Gary Cole, not Gary Coleman. Mm -hmm. He's not Although here. we're never seen in the same place. No, no, that's anymore. true. So you never know who you're seeing. Right. But thank you for watching Rick Drazen Live. And stay tuned next week or next month, I mean, when we have more guests. And we'll see you then.
Hope you enjoyed the video brought to you by Old School Labs. Use my discount code Grayson12 on the link below at OldSchoolLabs.com. Hey everyone, now you can have the Gold's Gym logo drawn by me, the artist Rick Drayson. Personalized and made out to you and signed by me to frame and put on your gym wall or wherever you see fit to do so. It's a piece of bodybuilding history. It will never be duplicated again. It's the largest selling icon t-shirt logo in the world. And I'm the guy that drew it. And I will draw it for you. Just go to my website, rickdrayson.com and order there. You can pay through PayPal and it'll be sent out right away. And be sure to watch Rick's Corner for all the videos on bodybuilding, nutrition, fitness, pro wrestling, and anything that suits your interests as far as getting physically fit and being the best you can be from the golden era of bodybuilding. Baby, see you next time.